It's been two and a half years since Nintendo released the Super NES Classic. Back in September of 2017, it was applauded for being the perfect holiday gift, assuming that you could find one. With its star roster of games, it was a smash hit with consumers, and why not? The Super NES is an iconic system with some of the best games ever made, and allowing for both old and new fans a chance to relive the glory days of the system on a modern television is a great move. Since then, the mini console craze has continued to evolve. Even Sony and NEC threw their respective hats in the ring with the PlayStation Classic and TurboGrafx Mini. But what about Nintendo? Where is the next system in the Classic or Mini line? Many have speculated that surely the Nintendo 64 would be next on the list. Even back in 2017, Nintendo filed figurative trademark applications related to various game controllers, including the Nintendo 64, fueling speculation that the system would return in its mini form. And in 2018, more reports about patent filings emerged. It seemed inevitable that an announcement would soon be made. So it's been about three years since the Super NES Mini was released and we're still waiting for the announcement of the Nintendo 64 Mini. But I'm here to tell you guys that I don't think there will be a Nintendo 64 Mini that ever gets released. And we're going to walk through a technical discussion as to the reasons why. Nintendo 64 emulation has been around since the late 90s. In the beginning, we had Project Unreality and the groundbreaking Ultra HLE, which we've covered on the channel before. But to reiterate, a 300 MHz Pentium 2 system with a 3D effects card could emulate Nintendo 64 at full speed in 1998. Games like Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, GoldenEye and many others worked. While it had its limitations, the future of Nintendo 64 emulation was bright, and it wasn't long before other advanced emulators came along, such as 1964, Nemu64, Korn, and Project 64. These emulators first introduced the plug-in system, essentially splitting up important parts into separate modules. These modules include audio, input, graphics, to name a few. The plug-in system, while standardized, also became quite tedious. For example, a certain game to work correctly may take a certain emulator and plug-in combination, but that same plug-in may have different results on a different emulator. The other major issue with the plug-in system was that they all relied on Windows and x86. Project 64 was easily the best and most compatible emulator at the time. It revolutionized Nintendo 64 emulation where Ultra HLE left off and it's still in active development today. But unfortunately, it's still tied to the Windows platform only. Other emulators such as 1964, Korn and Nemu64 also ran commercial games and used the plugin system as well. And they were also tied to Windows with heavy dependencies on x86 registers and no dynamic recompilation for any other architecture. But in 2001, an emulator known as Moopin64 was developed from the ground up to be cross-platform, which initially ran on Windows and Linux, but ports emerged for OS X and FreeBSD. Moopin64 was just another emulator in a long list being developed at the time, and while it did run commercial games, it was overshadowed by Project 64. By the mid-2000s, the focus of Nintendo 64 emulation had well and truly shifted to the plugins. Specifically, the graphics and RSP, or Reality Signal Processor plugins. One of the biggest issues with accurate and high compatibility Nintendo 64 emulation has to do with the Reality Display Processor, or RDP. Much of the information of the hardware had to be reverse engineered by hand, specifically around the microcode. Nintendo was reluctant to give developers access to this code when they were building games for the Nintendo 64. As a result, much of the emulation around microcode is taking a best guess at how to handle it. There is also the HLE versus LLE argument. Many developers opted for the HLE, or high level emulation in their graphics plugins. That is, approximating and replacing each Nintendo 64 3D API call with the equivalent OpenGL, Direct3D or Glide API call. In a perfect world, this shouldn't be too difficult, but with so many graphics cards on the market and with so many variations of features meant that some of these effects or features would just not work or would be emulated in software, which would reduce quality. 
HLE is also the best approximation and results can be hit and miss. In some cases, developers had no understanding of what microcode was doing and the game would simply not work. LLE or low level emulation meant that the RDP is emulated instruction by instruction which lends itself to increased accuracy but introduces performance bottlenecks. There are certain areas on the Nintendo 64 that have significant processing overhead on lower spec machines. When we consider what the Nintendo 64 strengths are, they are graphics such as lighting, frame buffer effects and texture filtering. It takes a lot of processing power and code to effectively emulate these graphic effects. Portability was also a problem with Nintendo 64 emulation. The standout Mupin 64 was lightweight and portable enough and it was the best choice to port to different hardware. The Wii 64 emulator on the GameCube and the Nintendo Wii is a port of Mupin 64 to PowerPC. Mupin 64 has also been ported to the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. By 2007, the emulator was discontinued and it was forked into Mupin 64 Plus, which improved on almost all areas, including adding a 64-bit recompiler, a better plugin system and more features. The plugin specification was also redeveloped to be streamlined to run seamlessly across different architectures. Mupin 64 Plus was ported to ARM devices such as the Raspberry Pi and included ARM-based dynamic recompilers and OpenGL renderers that meant that even low-power devices such as the Raspberry Pi can finally run Nintendo 64 emulation. Since then, we've had further advancements of forks of the Mupin 64 Plus codebase, which includes Parallel, Mupin 64 Plus FZ and others. There's also been some recent advancements in plugin technology, including Parallel RDP, which offers integer perfect upresing of games. Other plugins, such as Angry Line, is a low level emulation graphics plugin that's pixel accurate, but also requires a fast PC to reap the benefits. If we go back and consider the Super NES Classic, it retailed in the United States for $79.99 and ran on an ARM-based all-winner R16 chip, which is a quad-core Cortex-A7 with 256 megabytes of RAM and a Mali 400 GPU. It's a very cheap SoC, but it's powerful enough to run Super NES and the NES Classic. But how does it handle the Nintendo 64? The answer is not very well. The main problem with Nintendo 64 emulation with low powered ARM devices is that in general, although first impressions are that everything seems to run well at a glance, a number of problems will start to quickly appear. In general, a slower ARM based CPU will struggle to run at full speed. Some games will, for example Super Mario 64 runs well on pretty much anything you throw at it. But the problem is, there's going to be moments of stutter and hitches when the dynamic recompiler is caching its next block of instructions, or textures are being loaded in. These hitches and pauses are inevitable. With faster machines means you won't see them as much, but they are there and always present. But let's for a moment assume that Nintendo wants to build a Nintendo 64 Mini and put 20 games on it, and targets hardware that's more in line with the Raspberry Pi 4. For those not familiar with the Pi 4, it's spec'd higher than the Super NES Classic and comes with a Broadcom BCM2711 quad-core Cortex-A72 64-bit SoC clocked at 1.5 GHz which is able to be overclocked to over 2 GHz and a Video Core VI GPU. This definitely nets us better performance overall, but again, many games suffer in performance. The problem isn't so much about low CPU power, it's about the emulation itself. You see, there are many long-standing emulation bugs that exist with HLE plugins. For example, this shadow issue in Pilot Wings here. Most emulators will use a cheat code to patch this shadow out. Or how about Dr. Mario that doesn't run correctly? Or a game like Killer Instinct, Goldeneye and Conker's Bad Fur Day that won't run anywhere close to full speed. Super Smash Bros. 64 also runs slow, and these are just a few examples of a wide range of Nintendo 64 games that have either graphical issues, performance issues, or in general just won't run the way you expect them to. But with a powerful PC, many of these issues can be eliminated by resorting to LLE plugins, which provide increased accuracy. But there is no benefit here on a cheap ARM device that's non-x86 based. It's simply not powerful enough and these devices are what make up mini or classic systems in the first place. Another issue with Nintendo 64 emulation is how the GPU will handle texture filtering, resizing, upscaling and more. 
Modern GPUs handle this by using four sample points, but the Nintendo 64 only used three. This can result in artifacting, incorrect texture bias, and in the worst case, overall inferior results. Other filtered issues include 2D sprites and text. For example, notice the cutoff text on the Conker's Bad Fur Day intro. These issues are addressed in more modern iterations of Mupin 64 Plus, which do exist on ARM devices, but each of these require additional processing performance or a custom shader to address the issue itself, which leaves less processing time for the emulation core to run. Some of the plugins themselves need to resort to game-specific hacks to work around issues. In some cases on ARM-based SOCs, it uses a subset of OpenGL known as OpenGL ES, which is missing support for features that an OpenGL plugin or a Vulkan renderer expects. For example, this horizon in Pilotwing 64 only occurs on Android-based SOCs that use OpenGL ES. On a regular OpenGL renderer, this issue does not occur. Now you're probably thinking, what about the virtual console on the Nintendo Wii that was released in 2006? It played over 20 Nintendo 64 games without any issues, and that was years ago. And yes, that is absolutely true. The difference here is that it was heavily optimized PowerPC code, and essentially each game ran its own standalone emulation core. In homebrew circles, there exists injection programs to inject other ROMs into these emulators, but none of them ever worked well enough. Many hours of time and investment went into each individual game to make sure that they ran well under Virtual Console. Now you could argue that these games could be then ported across to the ARM-based SoC and the Nintendo Mini could yet live again. But with the Nintendo Wii having a much more optimized GPU that was meant for games, the Mali 400 for example in the Super NES Classic is a general purpose GPU that covers a wide range of markets but doesn't do a particularly great job in any of them. Last but certainly not least, let's assume Nintendo had the green light and they had the appropriate hardware in place to build the Nintendo 64 Mini. What would be the best 20 games that you would put on there? Due to licensing issues and more, some of the very best Nintendo 64 games simply cannot make their way to a Mini or any other collection. The obvious standout is Rare, with GoldenEye, Perfect Dark, The Banjo Games, Killer Instinct, Jet Force Gemini, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Blast Corpse, the list goes on. While you could piece together a solid list of Nintendo 64 titles without the Rare games, it wouldn't be the same. Ultimately, while I do believe that this is something Nintendo has looked into, I think the challenges with Nintendo 64 emulation, the price to deliver a quality product, and the omission of some of the best games in the lineup due to licensing makes the Nintendo 64 Mini or Classic a difficult one. I just can't see it coming personally. I think we will see Nintendo 64 games running on the Nintendo Switch however, with the rumored Super Mario 3D Collection being announced. The Switch has enough horsepower to offer up a solid Nintendo 64 experience, but for a cheaper ARM-based SoC like an Amazon Fire Stick or a Raspberry Pi 4, the experience will be pretty decent, but will contain some glitches and stutter here and there. And at the end of the day, pretty decent isn't going to be good enough. Nintendo needs to deliver a quality product, and because they can't guarantee that unless they offer the Nintendo 64 Mini with more powerful hardware that would certainly drive up the price, I just can't see it happening. So what do you guys think about my thoughts and opinions about the Nintendo 64 Mini? I think from a technical standpoint, it just doesn't make sense for Nintendo to consider bringing Nintendo 64 Mini to a cheap ARM-based system. I think they have to spend more money in research and development and ultimately come back with a better chip to run emulation on and that will drive up the cost of a mini system to probably around $150. Now, many of you are probably thinking, well, I would still buy it for $150. Absolutely agree with you, but I also feel like we're getting dangerously close to the Nintendo Switch Lite cost that it would really kind of price itself out of the market. So I don't necessarily see Nintendo really coming up with a solution for the Nintendo 64 Mini anytime soon. And I definitely want to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. 
Am I way off base here or do you think that there is some semblance of what I'm talking about is making sense with, you know, what your thoughts and opinions are? I definitely want to hear what you guys have to say on this topic. Well, guys, we're going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.